You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners, and welcome to episode 79 of the Common Descent Podcast. Woohoo! This episode is about pterosaurs. Woohoo! Pterosaurs are the amazing, majestic, flying reptiles of the Mesozoic. They're not dinosaurs. Nope. They're not birds. They're not pterodactyls. Nope. Not really. More on that later. <laughs> In this episode, we're going to talk about what they are, what makes pterosaurs unique, what makes a pterosaur a pterosaur, and all the incredible things that we know and don't know about their evolution and their lifestyle. Yeah. They are, some might contend, some of the coolest animals of the Mesozoic. They make a strong argument that they should be put in that position because... Man, are they weird and cool and unique. My, I love weird animals. Yes. I like snakes because snakes are weird. I like a lot of things because they're weird. Boy, are pterosaurs weird. It's hard not to <laughs> want to tip a hat when there's something that's just this bizarre and unique. And not just like within the time period they're in, but it's, there's not much that you could just compare to them. Be like, yeah, no, that's a one for one. Comparison? No. 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 This episode has a fun little history here at, at that, that Common Descent, because I was ready to do this episode in 2017. Yes. Because we or we started off the podcast with a list of ideas, and we were working through and going, oh, this will be a fun episode, ideas that we came up with. And then as the, the year went on, we got requests from our listeners. And by the later part of the year, we had been putting off more and more doing our own ideas. And so I was ready to do, at one point I was like, ooh, pterosaurs, I'm, I want to do pterosaurs. And I kept putting it off, and then we decided, well, we're only going to do listener requests. Yes. Because that makes the more, most sense. Oh, because it's the best. That's, it's fantastic. Well, at the time, we didn't have any pterosaur requests. Yeah. So kind of put the idea over on the shelf, and for about a year, it was a little inside joke yes. between the two of us. Every now and then, I'd look at the list. Still no pterosaur requests. Yep, yep. It was just we double check. And by the time we got out the first one or two, there were a bunch of other topics that now we were working on. And so it, it's been sort of this lost episode topic for <laughs> us for a while. Well, as 2019 drew to a close, we went back to the request list and found that pterosaurs, while we were looking the other way had become the most requested topic <laughs> so far in the history of our podcast. Evidently, we were not alone in thinking that this would be a cool topic. This topic has been requested by patrons Nils, Renee, Patrick, Eric, and Klaus, who requested it like a week before we were recording. <laughs> and also... Austin, Bodhisattva, Colum, Ed, Jaster, Rip Rattle, Ryan, and Tom. Long list of names. So, here it is, everyone. <laughs> We're talking pterosaurs. The episode we've all been waiting for. <laughs> Literally, you've all been waiting for. It has beaten... The, I think the previous record holder was Turtles at episode right. 60, which there were 10 requests. This is 13. Yeah. So, right. what what will, what will be next? It's up to you all to figure out what's going to be the next record breaker. <laughs> Before we get into the discussion... Uh, announcements and indeed this episode our announcement is mostly one announcement about patreon yeah as our listeners know we have a patreon you can donate to us and help support the podcast uh, this podcast is fully supported by our patronage it covers our costs as well as the extra stuff we're able to do patrons who donate to us get goodies like bonus content bonus audio extra stuff and if you donate at a certain level, we'll say your name on the podcast. This time around, we are giving a shout out to Philip, Nate, Jesse, and collectively, Vrushali and Neil and Ryan and Aaron. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everybody. 2020 has just begun, and we have been having discussions lately about what we're going to do with our patron funding moving forward into the new year. 
We have lots of plans to further the reach of the podcast. We're hoping to go back to Dragon Con. We might go on other trips. We have some other plans that aren't quite finalized yet, so no. keep your ears open. Mostly we try to use the money that we have to further sort of our mission, which is spreading knowledge of the natural world. Mm -hmm. And with that, hopefully an appreciation of the natural world. And as an extension of that, hopefully an urge to conserve and protect and do what's best for the world around us. Yes. At the end of last year, December 2019, we received the biggest monthly payout mm -hmm. we have yet gotten on Patreon, which was very exciting, for a grand total of $500.71. And I don't just bring that number up to brag about it. No. We are extremely grateful and humbled it's amazing to have that kind of patronage and with that kind of funding uh comes the ability for us to execute our mission in a way that we otherwise may not have been able to mm -hmm. so we have decided that the first use that we're going to do in 2020 with our patron money is to donate that entire monthly payout to wires the wildlife information rescue and education service based in New South Wales, Australia. Yes. This is an organization, a volunteer organization, that is dedicated to educating and protecting, rescuing wildlife down under. Right now, dealing with the worst environmental catastrophe in the organization's history. If you're unfamiliar with what's going on down in Australia, we urge you to learn about it, get involved somehow, we know that not everybody has the money to donate to things like this. Not everybody has the time to learn a ton and spread the information. Not everybody is lucky enough to be able to contribute their voices to what their governmental leaders do Yes. in regards to environmental situations. But if you can, we strongly encourage you to donate or learn or vote and help deal with what's going on down in Australia and other places around the world. Absolutely. The earth is our home yes. and we're all in this together. And, and we, we have one. And <laughs> right now one of our rooms is on fire. Yeah. So uh, to all of our listeners in Australia, or if you have friends and family or colleagues in Australia, stay strong. We're pulling for you. Yes. And hopefully our donation will help uh, with some of the environmental rebuilding that will have to go on down there. No, we're, we're happy to be able to help this way and grateful to our patrons who allow us to be able to help out in this this way for this, uh, this current situation. So thank you to all of our patrons, present and past. Thank you to all of our listeners who support us. Thank you to all of the people who keep us going. Yes. And thank you right now for listening to this episode. <laughs> and speaking of current events... We're going to segue over into the news. Yeah, back on track. Before we get into our main topic every episode, we talk about news from the world of paleontology and related studies that interest us, that we hope will interest you. Will, what do you bring to the news today? Cassowaries. Ooh, all right, I'm on board. Let's do it. So cassowaries, for anyone who doesn't know, is one of the largest birds alive today. It's a flightless, you know running on the ground with two big powerful legs bird they have this crest on their head. A helmet you know this this keratin crest on the head and very colorful neck and are famous for on their inner toe having a long nail a long claw that they use when defending themselves or protecting their territory to jump and slash at their victims makes them very dangerous i use the word victim because they're one of the only birds to have caused a human death yes <laughs> one of the one of the few i've heard them described as one of the few species of dinosaur to have killed a human being. yes exactly <laughs> <laughs> very cool birds they're found in australia and far north queensland and papua new guinea uh so not very widespread isolated there's only a uh, few spots you'll find them in but this is research about their relation to the other flightless birds we have today Okay. As we uh, continue to figure out how all of these weird birds are related to one another. This is research by Phoebe McInerney et al. in Evolutionary Biology. And the press release is from phys.org by Flinders University. So, the cassowary. 
is one of a number of semi-large flightless birds, not all of which are large. The group that the cassowary is in is known as the paleognaths. And these are often considered primitive birds. Right. It, it was just to say basal, Bas early yes, branching. Exactly. That these have features that go back further in the bird ancestral line. They have retained a lot of those features and they separated from other birds very early on. This includes things like the ostrich, the emu, the moa, the tinamau, the kiwi, the rhea, and the extinct elephant bird yes. from Madagascar. You may have heard the term ratites. The ratites, yes. So these are most of your two-legged, very, very flightless. Like, most of them have, yes. you know, almost non-functional wings. Some of them for anything. Like, their wings oh, yeah. don't do much of anything. I think there were some moas that lost the forelimbs <laughs> completely. You know, the, the, surprisingly, the ostrich is probably the one that still uses its wings for the most stuff. Yeah, for dancing. Yeah, they're so, they're so cool. <laughs> well... They've been trying to figure out exactly how all of these birds are related, interrelated to each other. You know, who's related to who. And this new study took a slightly different approach and looked at internal anatomy of the birds, focusing on the syrinx, hyoid, and larynx. So the parts used for breathing, eating, and vocalizing. Okay. The parts of the throat. And they 3D modeled by CT scanning them. Ooh which suggested some weird interrelationships not between the birds you might expect, or the ones that seemed most similar. The cassowary, the moa, and the tinamau were shown to be most closely related, which lines up with some DNA evidence. Interesting. Which is weird because the moa and the tinamau, this extinct moa, are South American. Oh. Yeah. So if cassowaries are linking with them, that suggests some cross-continental relationships. Exactly. So th this is not the relationship. They're not related to the emu. They're not most closely related to the emu, at least, which shares the same continent with it. Right, right. It has close relation to other uh, ratites from South America. This study is also cool because it's showing a new way of looking at these birds the larynx is showing to be a very good uh, measure of analyzing this sort of relationship traits between the birds uh, more reliable than other atomical features that were classically the go-to's so this might be a new way of looking at how birds are related to one another and we might see this pop up more if this research holds up to scrutiny well that's pretty fascinating yeah it's a, we've talked in the past about how different groups of animals in the fossil record, the most informative body parts are different. Yes. So like mammals, it tends to be teeth. With something like snakes, you're typically using the vertebrae, but you want the skulls. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, different from, from group to group. And it's always fun to hear about how that's also true in modern animals. Yeah. That if you're looking for relationships... Yeah, sometimes you have to look at the voice box. It's also interesting when what what causes some features to be better or worse. Like mm -hmm. for some animals, it's like, well, this feature doesn't help because it basically looks the same among all of them. Like it has not diversified much, so it's not really going to give you much information. Right. Or there are other groups where it's like, well, this feature won't help you because they keep convergently evolving it. Yes. You know, like Croc's sh skull shape is one of those where it's like, well, they keep just doing the same stuff individually with their heads. Right, they keep copying each other. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like, why the differences is also really interesting. And yeah, it's fun to find out. It's fun when a study goes, we actually found this weird thing yeah. to be really useful. This one weird trick. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's fun. I'm going to take us much farther back with my first bit of news and talk about the recent discovery of what appears to be the oldest known scorpion. Nice. I approve. This is research by Andrew Wendruth et al. in Scientific Reports, and we'll link to an article in Smithsonian Magazine by Catherine J. Wu. Scorpions, uh, certainly most of our uh, listeners are familiar with scorpions. Yeah, Little... they uh, use the chain... To pull you across the battlefield. Right, to get... You, come to over get here. Over, yeah. right, get over here. Get over here. Uh, Spider-Man hates them. 
So <laughs> scorpions, you know, with the venomous stinger and the claws up front. This new fossil discovery is two fossils, each about an inch long, from what's known as the Waukesha biota in Wisconsin, here in the United States, dating to the early Silurian around 437 million years ago. Wow. This deposit is representative of an ancient reef system, which is significant because scorpions have been pointed to as potentially one of the first groups of animal life, if not the first group of animal life, to move from water to land. Right. At this point, it is important for me to specify that we are not talking about Eurypterids. We've talked about Eurypterids a bit in the past. We talked about them a lot in our first episode of Spotlight with mm -hmm. Dave Marshall. Eurypterids are called sea scorpions, and these are the aquatic scorpion-looking creatures that go way back to the Cambrian and whatnot, some of which were like meters in length, <laughs> ridiculously sized. Not actual true scorpions. No, they were superficially convergent, and some of them seem to be kind of functionally, that they had a barbed tail mm -hmm. that they used. But they were not the same group. No. These new fossils appear to be true scorpions, like we know scorpions today. Cool. They were identified as a new genus and species, Pariocorpio venator, and they look a lot like scorpions. They have clawed pincers up front. They have a long tail that is not fully preserved, but the authors say it probably had a stinger on it. Huh. And what is preserved of the internal anatomy is also very similar. Aspects of the respiratory and digestive system look like scorpions. Weird. Which is interesting because it suggests that scorpions have been very similar in anatomy and probably behavior for a very long time. Yeah, a very conservative in their evolution. Not everything is very scorpion-like. Uh, modern scorpions have multiple small eyes like spiders do. These scorpions have big compound eyes. Oh, cool. Similar to insects or what their arthropod ancestors probably had. That's it, they they look like what cartoonists draw scorpions to look like. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it was found in a reef deposit, which is notable because like I said scorpions are among the earliest animals to move on to land, so the authors are excited that these might represent an early part of that evolution. They point out that these appear to have been spending time in water, but what's preserved of the respiratory and circulatory system suggests they were breathing air, hmm. or at least capable of breathing air. The authors say that there's still not 100% on whether or not they want to declare how aquatic they may have been. There's, you know, they'd like to, for example, it'd be nice to find gills. Yes. You know, things like that that would be a little more indicative. Little scuba tanks. But, at least at first glance, these appear to be very modern-looking scorpions in an aquatic environment. The authors suggest that what they might have been doing is living a lot like modern-day horseshoe crabs. Okay, yeah. It's living in water and then occasionally coming out onto land for, you know, their own scorpion purposes. And if we are here seeing some of the earliest evidence of scorpions as they made their way from water to land, the authors point out that the similarity that this bears to modern scorpions suggests that they may not have changed very much. Yeah. Like, behaviorally, they would have had to change. But it appears like the, the body shape they have was doing just fine in water, and then they came onto land and it did just fine there. Fascinating. I don't think I would have expected the earliest scorpions to look like scorpions if you had uh, posited it to me you know before hearing this because there are there are multiple members within the, the arachnid group that fall in that scorpion category of like whip tail scorpions and tailless yeah. scorp where they've got the claws and then that's it they don't have anything in the back that's at all scorpion like they've just got a big squishy abdomen I would have expected something more like that. A more simplified is the only term I can think of, but you know. Right. Well, scorpions seem so specialized. Yes. It's easy to assume that must be a recent thing. That, that Or that's something you had to work up to. It's also, I find 
my brain struggling to picture them in water. Yeah. Because as far as I know, if someone knows differently, correct me, uh, all scorpions are terrestrial nowadays. Like, I believe so. I don't, you know, because you even have like water spiders that go into the water, but I don't know that there are any scorpions that do stuff like that. It's such a a flip of what you would expect their, or what you might expect their early history to look like. That's really cool. Yeah. Scorpion's a good body design. So hopefully we'll find more of these early scorpions and see what their transition was like from water to land. And did they beat the centipedes? Yes. Yes. <laughs> or, or were they beaten? <laughs> <laughs> the early wars between centipedes and scorpions. <laughs> All right, so my first study was a little bit of a stretch, you know, to be in our normal news. It dealt with some extinct animals and everything. True, true. It was you know, evolution. It was evolution, related. but it was very modern. True. So for this next one, uh, it's even more of a stretch. Okay. <laughs> but I'm going to I'm gonna make it really I'm gonna make it long cassowary. <laughs> really long, very skinny, uh, <laughs> like storks, but with knives. Spaghettified. Uh, <laughs> this is a modern study about... The feeding habits of deep sea organisms. Oh. In and what foods they can handle and how they respond to new foods. It's not fossils, but I'm on board. Yeah. So this is dealing with. I'm. This is my pitch with taphonomy. <laughs> uh, okay. Taphonomy is what happens to a thing while or before it's being fossilized. Mm. Like, what are the processes that happen to a thing before we get it as a fossil? Was it moved? Did something chew on it? Was it exposed? What caused it to look the way it does now? Okay. All right. That's you, kind of what they're looking at here. You had my curiosity. <laughs> now you have my attention. <laughs> so this is research by Craig McLean et al. in PLOS One. And the article is by Brandon Spector from Live Science. Deep ocean critters, deep ocean uh, organisms are not typically characterized as being picky ears, uh, which is the term the article used. Right. You take what you can get. You take it. what you can get because the deep ocean is often considered a nutritional desert. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have enough sunlight to grow plants other than around deep ocean vents that are pumping out chemicals for things to grow off of. You don't have a, you don't have the bottom of your food chain. You don't have the energy source so all of your energy is coming from the food-rich, energy-rich shallows as it sinks down. Marine snow yeah. coming down in little bits. Every now and then, though, corpses, you know, bodies of animals are going to sink to the bottom. And that's going to be an energy boon, you know, a, a gold rush for the organisms, organisms down there. It's a little abyssal Thanksgiving. Yes. Food falls. Mm -hmm. you, know, you hear them, you typically hear about whale falls, but food falls are what these are called when a falls down and now there is this banquet these have been studied fairly thoroughly but usually focused on large mammals which are your typical big example whales and things like that it has been looked into less with other organisms and with more obscure food sources so they were wanting to know with these creatures who are rabid for any food they can get how would they react to a foreign food source? Hmm. Uh, something they wouldn't usually come in contact with. Can they handle it? How would something that came from another environment fare down at the bottom? Would it be left alone because it's foreign? You know, or would they be able to handle it because it's not their typical food? Interesting. So it's for misplaced things, basically. Right, right, right. How would things go? <laughs> And the things they used... I'm I, so excited to hear this. I reveal my bias. We're alligators. Yeah, I, <laughs> sure, that's fine. <laughs> so this would be, you know, I, I guess the idea here is every now and then a gator gets washed out to sea or, you know, takes a wrong turn somewhere and ends up miles yeah, out into the ocean. Or a, or a storm, like a hurricane, yeah. literally washes them out. And you end up with a gator falling down to the sea floor, where the deep sea organisms have never seen a gator yeah. before or at least would not be typically prepared for one and so that's they went with alligators for two reasons one they're freshwater so they are not you know unlike crocodiles they are not hanging out in the open ocean and even most crocodiles are not going out that far and they are tough 
very thick hide, leathery yep. skin osteoderms. They aren't soft skinned like many of your larger marine animals might be. They took three dead alligators and put weighted harnesses on them and took them out to the Gulf of Mexico and dropped them 6,600 feet down or two kilometers to the bottom of the Gulf. Deep enough that we're gonna get some of those low carbon environments where there's not a lot of food. And then they left them there. And then they came back to check later to see how each one was faring. And this article is tons of fun because each gator has a very different story. Oh boy. So the first gator they checked on one day later, not expecting to find much uh, because typically the thought has been that it takes things a little bit of time for the smell of the thing to waft far enough to bring in these these scavengers and that this would have been a foreign smell, mm -hmm. you know, not your typical smell. One day later, it was in the process of being picked apart by giant isopods. Wow. And already there were giant isopods who had made their way into the cavity, the body cavity of the gator. Wow. So giant isopods are big. They look like big undersea pill bugs. Pill bugs, roly polies. Potato, whatever else. Whatever uh, you. Wood louse. Wood louse. Yeah, whatever you call roly polies <laughs> where you're from. <laughs> and yeah, these are massive, like foot long. Yeah. Pink <laughs> isopods. Like modern day trilobites. Yes, they're very reminiscent of that. And they are one of the characteristic scavengers of the, the deep waters. They they chew through stuff, and they were able to chew through the gator no problem, it seems. Huh. And were stripping it as they would have anything. And they got to it very quickly, which was not, you know, the speed was quicker than they had expected. The second gator, as the article put, put it, fared even worse. <laughs> <laughs> So they, they checked on it later. They gave it more time to see what would it look like with more time. And it was 51 days later. Okay. And it was picked clean to the bone. Wow. Completely clean. And there was some brown fuzz within the cracks of the bone. Ooh. That were bone-eating worms. Yes, I was hoping. <laughs> yep. I was hoping for bone worms. <laughs> Which DNA analysis revealed was a new kind of bone worm. Very cool. In the order, the genus Osidax. Yeah, Osidax bone worms. Mm -hmm. And this was a, a new kind that hadn't been seen before. And once again, in new bones. Like, yeah. these are large reptilian bones, not mammalian bones. So, it's one, they, uh, they again were kind of surprised to find that processes were happening with a n seemingly no hesitation on this foreign body. And then the final gator, number three, they never found. Ooh. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> within the first week, they went back to check on it within the first week, and it was gone. It had been torn from the, har the weighted harness and was completely missing. By undersea velociraptors. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> they said the weighted harness was a combined 80 pounds or 36 kilograms. Which means it would have had to have been a large predator to wrestle it away from that. Which means most likely a shark came along, yeah, yeah. ripped the gator free of the harness, and then <laughs> took it away. Wow! They should have put a <laughs> collar on it. Right? <laughs> That's awesome. Holy cow. So yeah, the, the deep sea really doesn't care. Uh, you know, I, I gotta say, I'm, now I, I'm not an expert on deep sea bi marine biology, but this doesn't surprise me. A, it doesn't surprise me that they would eat it. I, I, As one of our favorite podcasts is fond of saying, meat is meat. Meat is meat. <laughs> you eat it. But also, I'm honestly not surprised by the new type of bone worm because it feels to me, and if you're a marine biologist and I'm speaking outside of my <laughs> expertise, let me know. But it feels to me like this is so rarely studied and I don't know how many different parts of the world this has been studied. There's got to be a remarkable diversity of different undersea, especially tiny things like bone worms, that we haven't 
come across yet. So it doesn't surprise me when people are like, we studied a whale fall and found a new species of something. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, yeah, how many whale falls do we get to study? Exactly. Well, it's kind of like whenever they, you know, take expeditions down to the abyssal zone, you know, mm-hmm. the, the twilight zone. And it's like, yeah, we found something new. Of course you did. Like, yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> how many people have been down there? <laughs> yeah. <But laughs> like, this is this is trip number 13 to that yes. place. Like that's, yeah, that's so. Great. <laughs> you, you've you spent a couple of weeks down there. I'm sure there's more to find. Now, in case anybody out there is thinking to themselves, well, what does this mean for the fossil record? There are fossil food falls. Yes, there are. There are fossil whale falls. And one of my favorite studies of all time describes a fossil ichthyosaur fall. Yeah. Which, instead of breaking down at the end, appears to have become a reef because the bone hadn't evolved yet. Which is so cool. <laughs> Which is just so cool. So, but yeah, so this is taphonomy. What happens to the animal after it dies? Not what caused the death, yep. not what killed it. What happened to the body after? How do we interpret yeah. that process? Because that's one of the most common questions we'll get at the fossil site in places like is why was this bone found here and this bone found here? Or why was this skeleton found together and this one wasn't? That's taphonomy. Yep. And man, the answers to those questions are infinitum. <laughs> like, it's... It's such a cool realm of study. It's very interesting. Well, keeping with our trend of aquatic things, the last bit of news that I've brought today is about shells made into tools by Neanderthals. Cool! This is research by Paula Villa, or Villa, et al. in Plus One, also in Plus One. And we'll link to an article by Paul Rincon in the BBC News. There is a site in Italy known as Grotta del Moscarini, which is a well-known Neanderthal site. Place where Neanderthals lived. Neanderthal condo complex. Uh, This material goes back to about 90,000 years old. In this study, they were particularly looking at material of shells, seashells, that were modified. What uh, archaeologists and and, and paleoanthropologists will call retouched. Oh, that I didn't know that. That's yeah. cool. That is that this has been, you changed the shape of it to make it into a specific type of tool. In this case, they were looking at 171 retouched shells from 21 different layers in this deposit. Shell tools are notable because usually you, you, you know, you see tools made out of bone and mm-hmm. made out of stone and stuff. But shell is a little bit of a rarer material to use for tools. Yeah, well, I mean, it's only found in very specific parts of the environment. Yes, and indeed, it has been posited in the past that only one species could be going out and collecting rare resources to turn into tools. (laughs) You can guess which species claimed that about itself. Yep. These tools were made on the valves, which is the hinge part of of the shell, of the smooth clam Callista keoni. The question the researchers were most interested in were not, okay, they're making tools out of shells. Where did the shells come from? Yes. Three quarters of the shells were all worn down. They had evidence of other organisms, like, encrusting on them and drilling through them and modifying them and stuff. The researchers said those were probably collected on the beach. Yeah. They were washed up. They were tumbled around. These were dead clams and the shells washed up but about a quarter of them were smooth and shiny showed very little wear and tear which suggests to the researchers that they were collected while they were alive which means they were collected from the sea floor yeah today these this species of clam is still collected by people usually either by dredging which is when you sort of scoop along the bottom of the 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 water under under the water or scuba diving there are some places where you, it, it's shallow enough that you can wade out to find the clams but the researchers suggest that in order to be collecting a bunch of these clams while they were alive these neanderthals might have been diving yeah up to a few meters down below the surface to collect these clams that's fantastic which is one really cool just to picture Neanderthals skin dive. Right? They're not scuba diving. No. Because you need equipment for scuba diving. Yep. They're just diving. Just, <gasps> yep. Deep breaths go on down. 
And it expands this growing body of evidence that Neanderthals were using coastal resources. At other sites in Europe, there's evidence for Neanderthals fishing, collecting fish, collecting uh, oceanic stuff. That's usually for food, whereas this is for tool use. They're collecting materials. The researchers also report that in the same sediments, they'll find pumice stones that were being used as abraders. Yeah. And these, most likely, based on the local geology, were washing up on the beach. So they're collecting tool material from the water. That's really cool. This also fits in with another study that came out rather recently, and I don't remember if we talked about this, that looked at Neanderthal inner ears and found that there is a high incidence of a condition known as inner ear exoxtoses, which are bony growths in the ear, which today occur in humans, and it is sometimes known as surfer's ear. <laughs> it is a condition you often see in people who spend lots of time either in the cold mm -hmm. or in the water. That's awesome. Isn't that cool? I love that so much. Because, once again, about just our interpretate, our typical impression of prehistoric things... I can think of almost no example of you know, media things or even just discussions depicting early humans swimming. Oh, yeah. Like, we often show them not like they were out of shape, but very unathletic. And I feel like that's because a lot of times we assume that, well, yeah, but like, you know, swimming, like you have to learn how to swim and stuff <laughs> like well, and especially Neanderthals. So Neanderthals being our sister species, mm -hmm. are, are not quite Homo sapiens, our, our, our cousins. There's this very long, I, I don't want to say prejudice, but bias against yes. Neanderthals to be like, oh yeah, no, they were like big and beefy and they stabbed yeah, they were big your, mammals and they took them down. They were the cavemen. Well, they were your typical big muscly dumb guy for the... For the crew. Right. They were the jocks and yes. our species were the nerds and that's why we survived because we were smart and doing cool stuff. Yep. But there's mounting evidence in a lot of different respects, but in this case, that Neanderthals were collecting coastal resources, not just for food, but for material, for tools and such. And in this case, they might even have been diving for materials. And I should mention, because I forgot, that the authors also point out that it's possible that you can get stuff just washing up in a storm or something. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they found these tools in 21 different layers, different depositional layers, suggests that this was a recurring, regular thing. Yeah, this was... Not like a one weird incident. Exactly, yeah. This wasn't, uh, you know, oh my goodness, you know, look, look what George brought back. It's, no, no, go get us some new shells. Right. We've run out of George, the good ones. Go get us. Go yeah. uh, uh, sell seashells. Yes. yes. By the seashore. <laughs> <laughs> I love how we keep unraveling more and more of, of the Neanderthal way of life. Yeah. And the distance between us and them keeps getting narrower. And it's just so cool. <laughs> well, speaking of awesome ancient things, that will end the news section for this episode, which means that it is time for us to talk about some of the coolest reptiles that have ever walked and indeed flown <laughs> on this planet, the pterosaurs. Yeah. Stay tuned. Three times vertebrates have evolved flight which I will continue to maintain is the most ridiculous thing evolution has ever done. Yep. Given land-dwelling organisms the power to just move through the sky. Bats did it in the Cenozoic, birds achieved it by the late Jurassic, but the first group to do it in the vertebrates, we know insects, it's fine, <laughs> but the vertebrates were pterosaurs. Yeah, insects are in their own weight class when it comes to this stuff. <laughs> Pterosaurs are the famous flying reptiles of the Mesozoic era. They were around from a, about 220 to 230 million years ago 
all the way up to the end of the Cretaceous period at 66 million years ago, which means they were around for almost the exact same span of time as the non-bird dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. They are found worldwide in a variety of different environments on every continent on the planet. Their fossils are fragile and thus rare, but around 100 species of pterosaurs have been identified and named. They range not only in their ecological habits, not only in where they lived, but in their size. Just a bit. Pterosaurs run from pterosaurs. Are you often there? They're measured in wingspan. Yeah. How wide across from wingtip to wingtip if their arms are stretched out. The smallest pterosaurs had wingspans of well under a meter. I've even seen some reports of a foot or less. Itty bitty. To actual gargantuan giants with wingspans of 10 meters or more. For our American friends, that's like 35 feet. Yep. That's a small airplane. Yep. Now, before we continue, I want to address the word pterodactyl. Pterosaurs are a group of organisms, just like dinosaurs, just like mammals. They are a branch of biology. The first one ever described was a genus named Pterodactylus. Still a genus. It's still valid. Yeah. People still study it today. Because the first one was called Pterodactylus, a common name spawned out of it, Pterodactyl. And even as more and more of these animals were discovered, and the scientific grouping Pterosauria became the collective name for all of them, which gave rise to Pterosaurs as the common name, Pterodactyl kind of stuck around and got latched on to all of the pterosaurs. Yes. So you'll still sometimes hear people point at any pterosaur and call it a pterodactyl, even though originally that was just for the one particular kind. Uh, and if you want to be semantic, you can argue with people about it. Yeah. It's the a very common case of fame overshadowing the taxonomy. Yes. This is the first one. It's also one of the names that was used most often when when they were being discussed, and then continued to do so in the public eye. See also Mastodon, yep. Brontosaurus, and believe it or not, Tyrannosaurus. Yes, exactly. We'll talk about that some other day. <laughs> Along those lines, I argue that pterosaurs probably have the worst media representation of any ancient creatures. They're just, uh Yeah. They're not dinosaurs, but they're about as famous as dinosaurs, mm -hmm. but they're less studied and they're less ever present in the news and so so much of this information seems to get left behind when they they're also misleading in the fact that they have features that sure do seem like they should put them with one or another group mm -hmm. but they are in neither and so yeah they i really i think the reason that your statement holds water is that i have trouble thinking of just a general media, not, you know, excluding documentaries. Mm -hmm. General media representation TV, of them. TV, movies, video games. Yeah. That gets them right. And they all, they, they're making that, they still make the same mistakes they made a hundred years yep. ago in movies. So what we're going to do today is go through what pterosaur, what we actually know about pterosaurs. And I will take moments every now and then to yell about how they're misportrayed in the media. <laughs> Let's begin. <laughs> So, to begin, pterosaurs are united by a number of features. These include things like the fact that they often have very large heads and necks. Yeah. And small torsos. Really small They're compared to everything else. So oddly proportioned. It's like the body of a bat, <laughs> and then often these long necks and these big or long pointy heads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're more head than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> it's more head than reptile now. They have lo particularly long tail vertebrae is a feature of pterosaurs, apparently. They are also famous for having very thin-walled hollow bones, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. very similar to birds, which, like in birds, would have been a feature to reduce... Hang on, I mentioned this a little bit later. Now we'll get to that. Which, like in birds, is a feature for redistributing the weight yeah. in your bones, so you're strengthening the bones without adding extra weight. Exactly. You're maximizing the length you can make the bone without adding as little weight as possible. Well, and you're you're adding more strength into these struts of yes. bone, into the walls of bone, 
and leaving hollow space in between. You also see this in the skull. They have huge openings in their skulls. Yeah, they do. Uh, pterosaurs are famous for having, a, a, there's an opening called the anti-orbital fenestra, which in some is enormous, just this big hole in front of the eye. In many, it merges with the nasal opening. <laughs> so you have an eye, and then in front of it, just a giant gap <laughs> through the skull. The nostril you could snort a turtle through. Oh, and also, they have wings. Oh, yeah. Pterosaurs. I've heard that. Yeah, right? No, that's, it, it, not everybody notices, Yeah, but they have wings. Like birds and bats, pterosaurs have modified their front arms into their flying apparatus. But they've done it a different way. Yeah. Birds have sort of fused their hand into this rod that supports the center of the wing. And then the flight surface of the wing is partially flesh and skin and feathers. Yes. That's what makes up the actual surface of the wing. In bats, they have an arm and the hand, instead of being fused into a rod... All of the fingers are still there, and they're long and creepy and very flexible. And the wing membrane, which is a skin membrane, skin and muscle, is stretched between those fingers. Yeah, just like that little bit of skin between your fingers if it was like an umbrella. Right, it's like webbing, but for the air. Mm -hmm. Pterosaurs have it yet another way. They have four fingers on their hands, three of which are still fingers. Yeah. Just little claws up at the top of their hand. The fourth finger, which for us is our ring finger, but for them is basically their pinky, is super long like bat fingers, and the arm plus that long fourth finger forms the leading edge of the wing. And then the, the wing membrane stretches from the tip of that finger to the body, usually to the leg, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, to, the, to the hind leg, uh, to the ankle or somewhere in that vicinity. This membrane, this wing membrane, is not just a flap of skin. It's not like, you know, paper just flapping around up there. Yeah, just a tarp. It's full of fibers called actinofibrils. It's full of blood vessels, thin layers of muscle, and apparently uh, a air-filled layer within the membrane. Huh. So this is complex flesh. It's muscular. It's vascular. There's a lot going on in there to create a functional wing. Yeah, it's, it's you know, like... um layered fabrics where you have the different functioning layers put together to make you know your military suits and stuff like that that's really really cool what's more the wing has multiple parts this is not something i ever really thought about there are three major parts of a pterosaur's wing the primary wing is called the brachiopatagium this is the wing that is based you know underneath the arm so when you think of the wing of a pterosaur it you're thinking of the brachiopatagium the big airplane-like wings sticking out to the sides. Mm -hmm. This wing is thought to have changed shape passively during flight, just as the air moved over it. It was built to change shape to catch the air. But also, there's muscle running through it, so pterosaurs might have been able to adjust the shape of the wing on the fly to help their aerodynamicity. There is a variety of different shapes. Some are long and narrow, some are short and broad. Some pterosaurs have wings that look like they were made for flapping. Others were soaring and gliding uh, more efficiently. There has uh, been some biomechanical studies that have indicated that pterosaur wings might have been better at generating lift than birds. Ha <laughs> ha! So that these weren't primitive, you know, not great flyers that died out because they weren't good at flying. These were very highly specialized wings just because something's extinct doesn't mean that's because it was bad at what it was doing the next part of the wing is the propatagium which is a flap of skin in front of the arm it runs from the shoulder it ran from the wrist to the body yes and in pterosaurs is supported by a unique strut of bone that only they have called the pteroid bone yeah and it's thought that this may have acted like an extra maneuverable flap, like a wing flap, to help adjust the shape of the wing as they flew. Yeah, if you ever get to fly in a plane and you get to sit by the window near the wing, watch how the wing transforms its shape yeah. when you go to take off. And then the third part is the uropatagium, the tail wing. This is a flap of membrane between the legs of the pterosaurs which came in a variety of shapes. We'll talk more about that later. <laughs> and this is thought, again, to be an extra surface for lift 
and as you move the legs, may have been helpful in maneuvering. Yeah, uh, very rudder, very uh, tail fins. Yes, so if you need to do a barrel roll, <laughs> you're engaging back in the Europatagia. I love... I, the fact that they have multiple parts of the wing is interesting just because so often wings are shown to be a thing that you can just... All right, we put a wing on it, and now it can fly. Right. Yeah, And it's... <laughs> no, wings are complicated things and these wings utilize the entire body yes which is really cool it's also neat because a lot of these sections of skin are very similar to the way you see the membranes on bats yep bats it's, have a europatagium mm -hmm. and that's very cool that this is if you're gonna turn your body into a kite there are a few key features to doing that. <laughs> and it's interesting to note how, you know, birds have this incredible diversity of flight capacity because of their feathers. Mm -hmm. The feathers allow you to modify the wing shape in ways that no other animal can. Bats, it's their fingers. So they can, using their bones, change the shape of the wing as they fly. Pterosaurs are either at, uh, relying on passive changes, which is what a lot of insects are thought to do, that the wing is built with built-in folds so that when it moves through the air, it crinkles in just the right way that makes it work better in the air. But pterosaurs also have different wing sections and have muscular action that can help them change the shape of the wing and the glider that they effectively turn their entire body into to achieve flight maneuverability in a similar way as other flying animals have. Like birds and bats, it takes a lot of muscle to fly. In pterosaurs, the flight muscles appear to anchor, and we can, you know, you look at bones and you can see the shape of the bone and infer muscle attachment to the sternum for chest muscles, the scapulocoracoid, which is the part of the shoulder apparatus, and pterosaurs are also famous for having a very powerfully muscled humerus, which is your upper arm bone. Because, yeah, that's where you need all your flapping muscle. Mm -hmm. Another adaptation related to flight, I mentioned that they have hollow bones, right? Thin-walled bones with reinforcing struts, but hollow in the interior, like birds. But also like birds, a lot of those hollow bones were filled with air sacs. Woo! Pterosaurs have pneumatized skeletons. That is to say that they have these gaps and impressions in the bone that indicate to us that like birds and like a lot of dinosaurs, they had these air sac systems running beside and often inside their bones. Some of these would have been part of the lungs. It, the air is passing through those sacs as it goes through the breathing system. Others, and birds have this too, would have acted like bellows to keep the air moving efficiently through the lung system. That's very cool. There are many benefits to this for a flying animal. Not just that it's a really efficient way to breathe. Birds are extremely efficient at respiration. Yeah, they're real good at breathing. Way better than us. It also helps reduce density. Uh, a lot of people fall into the misconception of thinking that the hollow bones are lighter weight. You know, a mammal bone is all spongy on the inside, whereas a hollow bone has redistributed the bone. It's reinforced. It's left a gap in the middle, but that doesn't make the bone lighter, it makes it stronger without getting heavier. Yes. But if you're filled with air sacs instead of bone marrow and bone, that can indeed help keep that extra weight out of the interior of the bone. It's also been suggested that air sacs penetrating the wing may have helped adjust wing shape. Ooh. And that if you have these air-filled sacs that you can move air through, they may even have been able to use them for display or thermoregulation, controlling your temperature. Ooh, weird. So lots of uses for air sacs on top of just, yeah, they're really good at flight. Birds have them too. Inflatable wings. <laughs> and then, of course, the other thing that pterosaurs are more and more famous for is that their bodies were covered in fuzz. Yeah, they're fuzzy. Not fur, but a particular type of integument that has been called pycnofibers which is a term that was coined in 2009. I think it was 2009. I don't have it written down in front of me, but it's very recent. Young term. These are simple, long, hollow fibers that would have acted basically like fur, probably coating the body for protection, to keep warm, uh, maybe colorful for display. These are found on lots of different pterosaurs. Uh, some of them were very extensively coated, so very fuzzy. Now, for a long time... <laughs> there has been this question of what is the relationship between pycnofibers and 
feathers. Yes. Pterosaurs, as we'll discuss in a moment, are very closely related to dinosaurs. Are these feathers? Yeah. Because it's... that st shape, that structure, is very similar to the earliest feathers. Simple barb shape. Well, a 2018 study uh, suggests that maybe they are very similar. Young et al. looked at two small pterosaurs from the late Jurassic of China and identified not just the standard pic picnofiber little simple uh, uh, filaments, but several different types of picnofibers that appear to branch, uh -huh. which is a characteristic feature of feathers. Yes. Having branching shapes. They uh, described the three different types that they found as bundles, tufted filaments, and a third type similar to downy feathers. Oh, wow. On top of that, they did a chemical analysis and found similar chemical composition to feathers and pigments like you also see in feathers. Starting to sound very feather-like. So now, I this is less than two years ago. <laughs> Not everyone's on board. Some have argued that... Is this really branching? Is it really similar to feathers? There's still discussion to be had, but if it is, it would suggest that pterosaurs either independently evolved a branching feather-like coat or inherited these feathers from the same ancestors that birds did. Yes. One way or another, pterosaurs were fuzzy. Which is probably one of my favorite aspects of them that I see portrayed least frequently. <laughs> Um, the movie Journey to Dinosaur Island from, I think, 2014 did put yes. fuzz on its pterosaurs. Yeah, but they, they they did a lot of cool stuff like that with representing the, the fossil animals. And that might be the only one that I can think of off the top of my head. Yeah. That did it. Because once I, again, like, there are documentaries, but that's right, their right. job. <laughs> yes. So if your documentary doesn't do that, it did a bad job. Right. Naked pterosaurs <laughs> doesn't make your movie a bad movie, but it arguably does make your documentary yes. a bad documentary yes <laughs> well and it's also a fun aspect of them because it's something we've learned rather recently yeah you know so that's that's that falls in the group of things when i was growing up pterosaurs were naked mm -hmm. and now they're not and that's very fascinating it also makes them cuter yeah. At which they should be. Especially the little one, like the little cat-sized pterosaurs. You can just like, cuddle up with it and it's all cute. It'd be like having a furry parakeet. It's just like, a, you know, a pet bird, but it was fuzzy. Yeah. <laughs> so pterosaurs have this really unique anatomy, a very so unusual in many respects, very similar to other flying animals in many respects. And so questions arise about how pterosaurs got that way. Mm -hmm. Where did pterosaurs come from? Now, we've talked in the podcast before about evolutionary transitions, and some we have excellent fossil records of. Birds, episode 37. Whales, episode 41. Humans, episode 18. Others, we have bits and pieces, like turtles, episode 60. We have a few yeah. hints at the early evolution. Snakes, episode three, same thing. Pterosaurs are more like bats. Yep. Episode 59. The earliest pterosaur, the earliest animals identifiable as part of the pterosaur lineage, go back to the late Triassic, as early as 230 million years ago, or maybe a little less, and they are pterosaurs. They are definitely flying. They have all the features you'd expect from a pterosaur. We do not have a pterosaur transition in the fossil record. Yeah, fully cooked pterosaurs is what we start with as far as our knowledge currently. So we don't, there's, I mean, there, there's hypotheses. Maybe they were gliders that, that developed the ability to fly. Maybe they did what birds have been suggested to do when they were running and jumping. But we have no fossils to indicate one way or the other, at least not yet. It's really interesting to look up the the conversations around the hypothetical pterosaur evolution and what might have happened to them and then to look up hypothetical bat evolution mm -hmm. and the thoughts around them and that you basically could do a word search function for bat or pterosaur yeah. and the articles would match <laughs> yeah, the same thing because <laughs> it's we're making the same guesses because uh, there's only so many ways that we know for something to get from the ground to the air 
Ha-ha. And this combines with the fact that pterosaurs are very weird, which makes them difficult to compare to other animals. So not only is their early evolutionary trajectory uncertain, exactly how they're related to other animals has been debated for quite a long time. Yeah, that's it's the nice thing with birds and bats. As weird as bats are, and as weird as their fossil record is, we have them. <laughs> yes, we have a lot of data to work with. So we can actually study them in, in some ways very extensively. Pterosaurs are more like turtles. Yeah. It's like, you are so weird, we don't know where you go on the family tree. Or at least for a long time, we didn't. Pterosaurs have been linked in a lot of places. Usually, they're identified as archosaurs. That's what I most commonly see. Which is the group that includes crocs, uh, dinosaurs, and maybe turtles, but go to episode 60. Yeah. <laughs> These days, most studies indicate that pterosaurs are the sister group to the dinosauriforms. Yes. That once you get down the tree, past all the not-quite-dinosaur things, the next branch over is the pterosaurs. Other studies have put them more basal to archosaurs, but most are saying they are nearest to the dinosaur forms. Yeah, that's what, the way I usually see it, is if you take archosaur and split it in half, you have the crocky stuff, and then on this side, you split it again, you have the dinosaur -y stuff and the pterosaur -y stuff. Yep. And that's how it, you'll usually see it break up, but give research a few years and maybe it'll adjust. Yes. There is, I found reference to one animal that has been identified as potentially closer to pterosaurs than anything else. Oh? And it is a small archosaur from Scotland named Scleromoclus. It is a small, gracile archosaur that is thought to have been possibly bipedal, maybe even saltatorial, which means jumping like a rabbit or a kangaroo. Yeah. And that's about it. Okay. So it probably looked a lot like the earliest dinosaur relatives are thought to have looked. A little skinny lizard type creature running on two legs with its legs underneath its body running around, which has been identified as possibly being close to pterosaurs, but it's a very much a basal archosaur. Yeah. So it's still hard to say if that is representative of the earliest pterosaurs. <laughs> Check in again in 10 years and we'll see what we know. Basal archosaurs, to me, always make me think of um, small mammals today when it comes to uh, helping people identify rodents. And then it's like, is it small and it lives on the ground? It's going to get lumped in with rodents. Right. At some point, someone's going to be like, yeah, yeah, mice and moles. Nope, nope, nope. Step, nope. step back. True. Yeah, no, yeah it's, and just <laughs> i feel like basal archosaurs are that all the time of like what did it look like it was bipedal uh it looks like it was probably predatory very skinny limbed long tail long tail uh some, some often longish neck yep cool and that's what we're <laughs> looking at here however once we get pterosaurs we can see some major trends in their evolution there are not a lot of pterosaurs known from the triassic which makes sense it's triassic early on but in the late Triassic, there are a handful. And indeed, the earliest pterosaurs show up not only abruptly in the fossil record and the late Triassic, but are all known from one part of the world. Hmm. The earliest pterosaurs are known mostly from Europe and Greenland. And so some have suggested that this might be representative of pterosaur evolution. They may have evolved quickly, rapidly uh, diversified in one part of the world, and then from there spread out to everywhere else. Others have suggested that it might be that they just aren't fossilizing, and we know they don't fossilize very well because of their thin-walled bones, so they may have had a more extended early evolution that was th and, and were present in more places, and we just haven't found them yet. Yeah, when your skeleton's made of balsa wood yep. it's pretty easy for you to get destroyed before you fossilize <laughs> however of the early pterosaurs we do know uh names uh, that i've never heard of before like <laughs> prion dactylus austria dactylus celestiventus ooh you dimorphodon not dimorphodon you dimorphodon okay all late triassic all from up in the northern continents they share some features that seem to be, have been common in early pterosaur evolution. For example, they are often heterodont, which meant their teeth were not all the same. They had variation in their teeth. Interesting. And multi-cusped teeth. Why? 
That is to say that they had multiple bumps on each tooth, like our molars do. So if you look at your canine, right, it's one point, but your molars have all these little bumps on them. Multi-cusped teeth, sometimes serrated. Okay, okay. Which are, uh, which is different from most later pterosaurs that have simple peg-like or cone-shaped teeth, if they have teeth at all, mm -hmm. but is similar to early archosaurs. All right, yeah, that makes sense. That these might be teeth features held over from their ancestry before they specialized later. When you initially said multi-cusp, my brain could not help but form the image of an early pterosaur flying around with just human-like dentures. <laughs> like a cartoon, just smiling. And it was the most terrifying thing my brain's ever created. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> These early pterosaurs uh, also came in a range of sizes. They were small, but small in the way that, like, modern birds are small. So the largest numbers I've seen cited uh, are wingspans of estimated up to a meter and a half. So All right. a five foot wingspan, which is, that's a reasonable bird today. Yeah, that's, a, if if I saw that, you know, I would, I would note that very clearly. That's not like yes. a sparrow that could <laughs> go unnoticed. That's, that's a decent size. While the smallest ones I've seen numbers cited of under a foot wingspan. That is pretty small. Once you get into the Jurassic period, you see the first of two major divisions in pterosaurs. Moving into the Jurassic, pterosaurs become more diverse and more widespread. They start to appear on other continents. By the end of the Jurassic and the early Cretaceous, pterosaurs are known from every continent on the planet. Nice. Pterosaurs in their entirety are generally split into two main groups. One of which is a real, authentic, good clade. Mm -hmm. The other is sort of an everybody else. <laughs> it's it's this group and then those guys. And the rest. <laughs> Traditionally, they were called the Rampharynchoids and the Pterodactyloids. Yeah. Now, the Pterodactyloids is a nice, they have a common ancestor, they are one branch mm -hmm. of the Pterodactyloid family tree. Rampharynchoids don't appear to be, it's a collection of different family groupings, which and from them spouted the pterodactyloids. So it's not a good monophyletic grouping. So these days, uh, oftentimes you'll just hear them all referred to as basal pterosaurs, or more accurately and more confusingly, non-pterodactyloid pterosaurs. Which is a very scientific way to literally say, and all the rest. And the rest. <laughs> <laughs> it was like two steps forward and two <laughs> steps backward. <laughs> but the two groups, groups kind of, are separated by certain features. Basal pterosaurs, the earlier groups that uh, were dominant throughout most of the Jurassic and those Triassic forms, tended to be smaller, often with shorter necks and shorter, beefier skulls. More robust. They also often have long tails. They are called the long-tailed pterosaurs sometimes. Their wings are oftentimes broad, and the uropatagium, the, the, the wing flap between the legs, is one big, broad membrane. All right, yeah, yeah. From ankle to ankle. And indeed, there have been discussions in the past about how good they would have been at walking, because they had their legs tied together by this flap back there. Yeah. More on that later. Like I said, these were dominant um, from the late Triassic to around the middle Mesozoic, they dwindle going into the late Jurassic. Some examples of them include some famous ones like Dimorphodon. Woo! Dimorphodon was an early Jurassic pterosaur wingspan of about a meter and a half. So five feet or so. Famous for its giant skull. Yes. This huge hatchet shaped skull. Uh, also large claws. On its hands, some have suggested that it may have been a good climber. Which is disturbing, that thing scrambling <laughs> <laughs> around. Dimorphodon is what is allegedly portrayed in Jurassic World, the yep. smaller of the pterosaurs. It was uh, the one I, ha I had many people who thought it was another made-up creature. Yes. Because, <laughs> to quote one of my friends, they thought they had just put a T-Rex head on a pterosaur body. And not to diminish Dimorphodon, their heads are real impressive. Their heads are real weird compared <laughs> to the others. It's awesome. Another example from late Jurassic Germany, Aneurognathus, which is one of my favorite pterosaurs. 
These are very small, Mm -hmm. so half meter wingspan range with these short bulldog skulls. Mm -hmm. Large eyes. Uh, I've seen them reconstructed as flapping uh, very maneuverably through the trees. Both Dimorphodon and Anurignathus have been pointed at as being among the most basal, the most early branching of the most of Mesozoic pterosaur diversity. I can see that. And then probably the most famous uh, of these non-pterodactyloid pterosaurs is Ramphorhynchus. Was my favorite as a kid because long tail to me was cooler than Mm -hmm. long skull and I loved Ramphorhynchus. And Ramphorhynchus, one of its famous features is that at the end of its tail, it has this diamond shaped Yeah, it does. Flap. This this little leaf. Yeah, like a demon. Yeah. Or or nightcrawler. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Because it is of mythology. Yes. Very, very cool group. In the mid to late Jurassic, and then especially in the Cretaceous, we see the rise of the pterodactyloids, the second major division, classical division of the pterosaurs. These also come in varying sizes, although their range of size (laughs) is much wider. (laughs) A bit more noticeable. They tend to have long necks and long skulls, so long pointy skulls. Uh, Most pterosaurs you think of are pterodactyloid pterosaurs yes they tend to have narrower wings they have short tails and their uropatagium their back flap is split so it's kind of in two pieces one attached to each leg which is thought to maybe have given them a bit more maneuverability both in flight and on ground yeah they've they've gone from uh, a skirt to pants yes (laughs) and indeed they're thought to have been very good on the ground because we have a lot of footprints from pterodactyloid pterosaurs. Which is so awesome. More on that later. Yeah, oh, I'm so excited <laughs> to talk about that. That's so cool. These were dominant in the late Mesozoic. They took over for the, the earlier pterosaurs in the late Mesozoic. Uh, they are famous also because lots of them had wacky head crests. Yeah, they got super crazy. Yeah, they sure did. With the back of their head. Here are a bunch of examples. <laughs> In the middle Jurassic of China, there is a pterosaur named Darwinopterus, which is famous for being, appearing to be the link between the earlier pterosaurs and the pterodactyloids. Okay. It has features that suggest both. Hence its name, Darwinopterus. I like it. Pterodactylus, of course, the first pterosaur ever described, uh, was from late Jurassic, uh, uh, from Germany. Wingspan of about a meter, so a few feet. Even more famous than Pterodactylus, Pteranodon. Oh, right. The pterosaur. Yeah. (laughs) Pteranodon is from the late Cretaceous here in North America. Toothless beaks. Mm -hmm. Crests sticking off the back of the head. Yeah, that big Mm boomerang-like structure on the back of the head. And big. Oh my gosh, they got so big. Wingspans for uh, Pteranodon are estimated to go up to around 5 to 6 meters. (laughs) So 20, 25 feet. Which is unnecessary. Like That's... Pteranodon, <laughs> calm down. That's, Slow it down. That is too much wing. So big. That's such a big animal. It, I, that's, you know, there are those moments where there are those uh, uh, just ridiculously large extinct animals that, like, it's hard to picture what a sauropod, you know, the long neck dinosaur. How did that move? I don't yeah. know. I've never seen a building walk. <laughs> right. This is the same way of, like... What does a plane look like when it perches somewhere? You know, when it lands and then walks (laughs) around. And walks around. I don't know. That's never (laughs) happened before. My dreams aren't that vivid. (laughs) So it's just ridiculous. One of my favorites is a pterosaur named Tapehara from Brazil, early Cretaceous, that had this crest over its nose that would have looked like a kite. Yeah. Just this big membrane. And a close relative of Tupendactylus which is what our teaser image yeah. on social media was. They had these, the, just these membranous crests over their noses. That look for all intents and purposes, not like the sailbacks on Spinosaur and mm-hmm. Dimetrodon, like an actual sail. Like a sailboat. Like a sail, like <laughs> they actually have the same structures of like, oh yeah, here's the mast and here's the arm. Right, here, here's <laughs> the, the upper str- str- strut and the lower strut. Yeah, it's like, this is a sail, how... Why? <laughs> and speaking of wacky crests, Nyctosaurus, from the late Cretaceous here in the U.S., had this branching antler-like crest. It's sort of a V-shape. Mm-hmm. Sometimes 
the crest could be longer than the animal. <laughs> you had this big, thin antler, like one strut, mm -hmm. and then another strut coming off of it that is longer than your body. Also, fun thing I learned about Nyctosaurus, and I'll... I can't even get it out. <laughs> so you remember how I described their hands as they have the three fingers, mm -hmm. which are basically like normal fingers, and then the fourth finger is the wing yes. finger? Nyctosaurus has no other fingers. Just the wing finger. I, Apparently lost its fingers. I don't... I can't describe why. That makes me really uncomfortable. No, it's real weird. <laughs> That's... What? Huh? What? Moving on quickly. <laughs> Here's one, uh, one more that I wanted to point out just for Will. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a pterosaur named Ludodactylus from early Cretaceous Brazil. Its name, Ludo, comes from Ludus, which is from the Greek word for play. Okay. And the reason is this. It was named in 2003, and researchers for a long time have lamented that toy makers, when making toy pterosaurs, would give them the pteranodon head crest but put teeth in the mouth. Yep. Which Pteranodon did not have. Yep. Ludodactylus has both. <laughs> <laughs> so they named it after toys that got Pteranodon wrong. That's so... The toys that made this dino... Yep. This, this Tyrannosaurus. Yep. <laughs> That's amazing. So there are a huge diversity of early pterosaurs, of pterodactyl pterosaurs, but one more group that I have to mention. What what could possibly be left to mention? Among the pterodactyloid pterosaurs in the latest Cretaceous. <laughs> right at the end of the pterosaurs' reign of terra. Mm, we'll cut that out. <laughs> saw the rise of a group called the Ashdarkids. Which is a cool name. Which had a, a variety. There was a diversity of Ashdarkids. But the most famous are three known genera that were unreasonably large. Yeah. Wingspans estimated at 10 meters or more. So an actual small airplane. Yep. Body weights estimated up to around 250 kilograms. So 500 plus pounds. So like four of me. All of these are known from just bits and pieces. So we don't know a ton about them. The most famous is named Quetzalcoatlus. Yeah. Quetzalcoatlus comes from Texas, and it's actually best known from a smaller Quetzalcoatlus species. That tells us a lot about what the body looks like. A small, you know, half-sized Quetzalcoatlus. Yeah, pipsqueak. That we, yeah, it was only pteranodon size. <laughs> and researchers have extrapolated a lot to say, oh, okay, yeah, no, this is probably, would have looked a lot like this smaller one. Hatsigopteryx lived in Europe on what was once Hatzeg Island, which is no longer an island, but during the late Cretaceous it was. A 2017 study found that Hatzegopteryx had a unusually fur and ashdarkid short neck, big, powerful skull, and have reconstructed it as possibly even a dominant island predator. Yeah, the pictures <laughs> that they've reconstructed for this one are terrifying. Of it picking up little sauropods. Just on these stilt legs. <laughs> And the third one is named Aramborgiania, uh, and that name is probably why it's the least known of, well, <laughs> yeah. un, well popularly known of the yeah. three. Bargin, bargin. That's it. <laughs> from Jordan, which is mostly known from a single neck vertebra, and then oh, a wow. few other bits and pieces. Now, I bring up these big fellas, partially because how can you talk about pterosaurs and not mention that they were, by an insane margin, the largest flying creatures of all time. Like, Pteranodon already had that record. Exactly, yeah. If they wanted to beat birds, they, di they did it, like, in the Jurassic... Well, maybe not in the Jurassic, but they did it early on. Yes. they got You got the record, but by the late Cretaceous... Not that they knew that. No. But in the Cretaceous, ter the pterosaurs were like, what's with these feathery things flying around? We'd better show them who's boss. Ten meter wingspans. It's like those uh, uh, Olympian comp competitors that break their previous record every time they come back to the lamp. <laughs> yep. like, let's just stop. <laughs> the, the Was eight not enough for you? <laughs> the size of these animals is is just baffling. And in many times, literal. Like, we have sh wrestled to try to figure out what in the world were these things doing. And indeed, I wanted to mention that their sheer size has led to a lot of discussion in the past about were they even 
flying. Yes. Because a lot of people will say, well, okay, if you're that big, can you even get into the air? Can you even stay in the air? Now, there have been suggestions in the past that maybe they were actually flightless, or that maybe they were, you know, going up a cliff and jumping off and having to glide from there. But the reality is, as of these days, there does not appear to be a significant scientific question. These animals were built for flight. Their proportions are the same as earlier flying pterosaurs, as far as we can tell. There have been computer models and biomechanical studies that have put them in, that have tested these body sizes. Mm -hmm. And as long as they're doing the right stuff, as long as they're flying properly, yeah, they seem to be, they have the right muscle attachments, they have well-developed wings, their wing bones are even more stress-resistant than smaller ones, even though the walls of the, the bones, even in the big, you know, these 10-foot, 10 10-meter 10 wingspan pterosaurs, the walls of their wing bones are typically around two to five millimeters thick. Wow. But they're extremely stress resistant. They are very sturdy bones. These aren't fragile animals. They're fragile bones once they're fossilizing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But in life, they are built to take a lot of stress. They're built for flight. There's no evidence of flightlessness in them. These things flew. Uh, some scientists have suggested that they probably flew in similar ways to the largest birds today probably soaring. Yes. They probably weren't landing and taking off and landing and taking off over and over again, because when you're big, it takes a lot of energy to get you off the ground. And there are plenty of birds that match that model. Uh, probably my favorite is the albatross. Mm -hmm. Go look up a video of albatrosses landing. Yep. And it's the clumsiest, <laughs> most goofy. Mm, they just thump. kind of belly flop into the sand, <laughs> because when you're that big... You can't, you have too much momentum. You're you're <laughs> going to controlled crash. And indeed, uh, it has been pointed out that once you get up there, being big actually can be helpful because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it makes you real fast. If you're glot, you're going to build up a ton of momentum. So these things would have been true, powerful flyers. A 35 foot <laughs> wingspan actually taking to the sky and crossing you know, one side of the western interior seaway to the other for lunch. Cue overhead jet noise. <laughs> <laughs> so pterosaurs are incredibly diverse. They're super cool, built for flight. There are a lot of questions about pterosaur lifestyles and pterosaur behaviors, which we will get into after the break. We are going to look at questions such as, what were pterosaurs like on the ground? Uh -huh. What did pterosaurs eat? And how did pterosaurs reproduce and grow up? Cool. Stay tuned. Pterosaurs are super famous, very impressive for their flying ability. But of course, you can't stay in the air all the time. And there have been long historical discussions about what were pterosaurs like when they landed. And because they have such a weird body plan. They're so oddly shaped. Yeah, compared to anything else we have to look at today. They have these ridiculous front arms, mm -hmm. these little bodies, these fairly small back legs, yeah. long necks, long heads. What? How did you even... What did you do on the ground? And so, like, yeah, the, 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 <laughs> there have been a multitude of suggestions as to how they were answering <laughs> the call of gravity back to the ground. Yes, and there have been interpretations in the past of them sort of sprawling like lizards, uh, even belly crawling, like yeah. a gator. Yeah. Uh, some have suggested that they were bipedal, like a dinosaur, like a theropod, like, yep. a, like birds, you know, just run, which is like a roadrunner. The pictures of those are always fun because of the way they have them hold the wings. It just looks like they're like, excuse me, excuse me, come yeah. on. <laughs> like just like holding up their skirt or something. And there have even been interpretations of them erect and bipedal, just yep. standing straight up. And for a long time, it was kind of uncertain because we didn't have good evidence to say one way or the other. But starting in the 1990s, researchers began to recognize pterosaur footprints. Trackways, which is just one of the coolest things. I, ah, that's so cool. Like, the the the, <laughs> the good fortune that we were able 
that of all the animals you got trackways for, we got them for these. Oh, thank you. Thank oh, you, fossils. So <laughs> and what they have found is that they were quadrupedal. They walked on all four legs. The forelimbs, the front arms, show them walking on three fingers. Mm-hmm. Except, I guess, Nyctosaurus. Who knows what that was doing? <laughs> but ter- normal pterosaurs ha- were walking on three fingers, which suggests that that fourth finger, that wing finger, was probably folded up next to them. Mm-hmm. And that they had, they were just moving around with their wings folded up. The front arms are digitigrade, which means they're walking on the digits. So the if you if you put your foot on the ground and then lift your heel up, but you're still standing, your toes are still flat on the ground. That's digitigrade. Yes, that's how cats and dogs walk. The heel is lifted off the ground. In pterosaurs, the forelimbs were like that. They were walking on the fingers with the wing finger folded up. The hind limbs were plantigrade. Flat foot. Flat-footed, like us, like bears, like raccoons, mm-hmm, right? The heel mm-hmm. is on the ground. They have four toes on the back, and the four toes point forward to create this kind of like a bear, kind of like a person, yeah. relatively straight yep. foot. Quote, quote, unquote, a normal footprint. What you would expect a footprint to look like. Yes. Now, I want to take a moment and address that. Four toes, flat foot, Toes pointing fairly forward. Mm -hmm. If you picture a bird's foot, many birds today, you will imagine they have, you know, often three toes pointing forward and a fourth toe turned around to face backwards. Yes. And they oppose each other, but birds have opposable toes. Exactly. This is what allows an eagle, for example, to wrap its foot around a branch or around the neck of a bunny. Yep. This is what allows them to perch. It's what allows them to grab something and fly away with it. Pterosaur feet did not do this. They didn't have talons. They did not have talons. Their feet were for walking. If you take your hand and you rubber band your thumb to the rest of your hand, you're looking at a pterosaur foot. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) Which means that at the end of the Lost World Jurassic Park, the second one, 1997, Mm -hmm. In the closing frames, we see this pterosaur land on a branch and wrap its toes around it. They could not do that. No. In Jurassic Park 3, we see pterosaurs grabbing people with their feet and lifting them into the air like a bird of prey would. We also see this in every gosh darn portrayal of pterosaurs. (laughs) In movies, TV, and video games, just about every time they show them doing this. Yep. Grabbing stuff with their feet. And don't get me wrong, that's a cool thing. Birds are awesome. Yes. Like, it's super cool that they can do that. Like, the fact that you turned your feet into hands is real neat birds. Yeah, especially parrots, like when they hold, like, a thing of yes. food up to their mouth. Pterosaurs did not have grasping feet. They had just feet. They were flap, 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 <laughs> flap. They, they were just feet. No offense, pterosaurs, you just had feet. You did, everything else you do is cool. You just have feet. Now, the trackways show us that they were walking on all fours in the most awesome way I can imagine. Kudos to Jurassic Park 3. It did actually show the pterosaurs walking yeah. on their uh, on their it's wings. Because they walk like wyverns. That's why it's so cool. Yeah, they do. <laughs> and the trackways show us that the footprints appear to be mostly in along the midline of the body. Oh. Which is to suggest that especially the hind limbs and to some degree, the front arms, were held under the body. Very archosaur of them. They had a parasagittal stance, like birds, like dinosaurs, like mammals do, legs under the body. Which means the uh, if you're picturing how they walked and you're picturing a bat when it moves around, they're folding the wings in a similar way to walk on the exposed digit like yes. bats do. But bats do this creepy, sprawly... Voldo walk. Right, they're creeping, they're crawling, they're on their bellies. Because kind of. my feet are backwards for hanging upside down, and my arms are wings now. That doesn't look like that's what pterosaurs were doing. It looks like they were just walking. Yeah, they, they looked like they were walking like a uh, ground sloth. Yeah. Big long arms, sort of sloped back, but just walking on all fours. Now, this is true of the pterodactyloids. The later group of mm-hmm. pterosaurs, mm-hmm. the ones with the split uropatagium. The earlier pterosaurs, the non pterodactyloid pterosaurs, had that contiguous uropatagium that kind of tethered the feet together. Yes. And like I mentioned, there, for a long time, people have wondered, oh, did that affect the way they walked? And so there have been all these questions about, okay, how, were you even good on the ground? 
Did you have to live in trees or live on cliffs? Were you just climbing? And this has gone unresolved because we've not found non-pterodactyloid pterosaur tracks. So you'd often see them in pictures just on trees like a squirrel or scrambling right, around right. like a bat. And some have wondered, do we not have trackways because they actually weren't walking on the ground? Yeah, because we're right. They're climbing right, right. surfaces, not the ground. Or is it that we just haven't found them because pterosaurs are bad at fossilizing and footprints are worse at fossilizing, <laughs> so it's not good. This has been an open, re- unresolved question until last week. <laughs> Until is one of the most exciting words. But this is not even, it's not even like, oh, but a couple months ago. No, January 16th, (laughs) a paper came out in the journal Geobios by Jean-Michel Maison, Maison, et al., that reports the first ever known trackways of non-pterodactyloid pterosaurs. I'm so glad we didn't do this topic for episode 78. Right? <laughs> we and this, everyone, is why we waited so long. <laughs> this is it. If we had done this in episode 22, we would have missed this one. Yeah. We needed it to get 13 <laughs> requests. These footprints come from a site from the early Jurassic of France known as the Pterosaur Beach of Kraysak. Good name. Because there's a lot of trackways there. In particular, they focused on six trackways that represent three new ichno taxa, ichno species, right? As we've discussed, footprints get their own species names. And what they found is the trackways suggest that they were pretty good at walking. Yeah. Like, they appear to have walked very much the same way that the later pterosaurs did. Does not seem like they were significantly hindered by those back legs. The authors in the paper say, quote, The concept of non-pterodactyloid good climbers and bad walkers has to be modified to good climbers and rare walkers. Unless there are many non-pterodactyloid ichnites. What a word. <laughs> what a word. Still waiting to be discovered. They are four-legged quadrupedal, four-leg walking animals that also have turned their front arms into wings. Yes. And it's super cool. Now, the question of how pterosaurs walked is one thing, (laughs) but there is a whole other question about how pterosaurs got into the air. How do you achieve takeoff? And I I, I don't mean evolutionarily. I mean an individual pterosaur. Pteranodons on the ground needs to be in the air. How do you do it? Because, like, takeoff is difficult. Yes, it is one of the hardest parts. And in some respects, it is the limiting factor on flight. Exactly, because, you know, we we take for granted, it's like, well, yeah, birds, you flap your wings, you go up. But if you ever watch them, they do crazy athletics to get onto the air. We have to create runways (laughs) to get our flying things into the air. And And we have to use giant engines and run it down like a mile (laughs) and now it's fast enough and one of the big questions around pterosaurs has always been you're so big Mm -hmm. and it's not just that being big means it's hard to stay in the air how do you get in the air yes if you weigh a hundred pounds 200 pounds or some of those big edge darkids that may have weighed 500 pounds how do you get into the air and for a long time People, or even early researchers would point at this and go, I mean, the models don't work. Yes. And one of the issues that they would often run into, and that modern researchers will point at, is that they were treating pterosaurs like birds. Bingo. Here's how birds work. Birds get into the air like all flying animals. This is important. Mm -hmm. Flying animals don't flap themselves into the air. They jump. Yes. Birds jump. Bats jump. Yes. This is how they do it. Birds have this amazing, incredible ancestry. They're dinosaurs. And one of the coolest things that birds inherited from their dinosaur ancestors are these big, beefy back legs. See? The cassowary. Delicious. (laughs) Back legs in birds mean they're good at running, they're good at leaping, and that is the part of the body they're using for takeoff. Birds can jump into the air. And indeed, the larger birds get, the bigger and bigger their legs have to get, not just the arms. The arms have to get bigger so that they have bigger wings. They're more powerful to move themselves in the air. But the legs also have to get bigger and beefier to push them into the air. Yeah, the landing gear. 
you know, once again, going back to planes, if you look at the landing gear on like a single person plane, it's just these little wheels. Yep. Take a moment to look at the landing gear on a passenger jet engine, <laughs> and it's like a car. And this presents a problem for birds. It means that as they get bigger, they have to add a ton of muscle in two places. Legs to get off the ground, arms to move around up there. Yes. Pterosaurs do not show the same relationship. Pterosaur back legs are comparatively small. And even in the largest pterosaurs, the back legs don't seem to get that much beefier and bigger. But the front arms get enormous in the biggest pterosaurs in terms of musculature and in terms of wing strength. This is a pattern that we also see in bats, which has led researchers to look at how do bats take off. And the most famous bats to look for for this are bats that spend the most time on the ground, notably vampire bats. The vampires. Because vampire, if, go, if you haven't, go to YouTube and look up a video of vampire bats and they'll like creeping around on the ground trying to bite at the heels of livestock and lick up their blood and stuff. These are bats that are real good on the ground. They crawl around. And when they need to take off, they also are not jumping with their back feet. They perform what has been called a quad launch. <laughs> they're using all four legs. What they're basically doing is a push-up. Yes. They're using their wings to push up. And I mean, the legs are helping. They're not doing nothing. Mm -hmm. But the power is coming from the arms. And this means that those animals are circumventing the issue that birds have. In birds, the bigger you are, the more legs you need. The more leg you have, the heavier you are, and it becomes yep. harder and harder to get up there. Eventually, you hit a critical point where your legs are too big no matter how big your arms are. You, mm -hmm. can't, you can't do it. But if you are an animal that puts all the power in the front limbs for takeoff and flight, well, then you only have to add muscle to one place. So more recently, researchers have been using this quad launch model for pterosaurs and have found that even the largest pterosaurs appear to be capable of getting off the ground if they're pushing up with the front arms. That pterosaurs could not have, maybe the, the bigger ones might not even have been able to launch if they were just using their feet. <laughs> and, re you know, older studies ha were, would say, oh, well, they probably had to jump off of cliffs or out of trees to even get off up yeah. into the air. You, s you see that represented if you anyone remembers Disney's Fantasia mm -hmm. and the Rite of Spring. They have that with pteranodons perched along a cliff face and dropping off of it like right. paratroopers. Now, that's not to say they never did that. Yeah, there are birds it, that use that method. That's a great strategy. But some studies using the quad launch model, the push-up model, have found that even the largest pterosaurs might have been able to get up off the ground, even off of level ground, <laughs> with no run-up. Just boom. Mm -hmm. One thing that is still waiting to be seen from this, and curse you, pterosaur fossil record, Grr. We haven't found any pterosaur launch tracks. Right. <laughs> Maybe someday that would sure be cool. It's just going to be two little three-fingered Im <laughs> deep impressions in the Real ground. Real deep impressions. Like, like Hulk footprints when he launches off. Just the I'm impressions with cracks in the I'm ground. I'm real mad you said that, and I'm going to tell you why after this next <laughs> section. Some of the trackways we found appear to be pterosaur swimming tracks. Cool. They're shallow scratch marks that look like paddling in uh, shallow water. And there have been other models that have suggested that pterosaurs were probably okay in the water. I mean, most animals are. They couldn't have rested on the water necessarily like seabirds do. But right? being leg heavy means mm -hmm. that you have this wonderful weight distribution yes. where you just kind of sit on the water. But it's suggested that pterosaurs may have been able to rest maybe less comfortably on the surface. And models have shown that with the quad launch model, they could even probably take off from the water. Really? Yep. Now, uh, one of the blog, I read one of Mark Witten's blog posts. Witten is a pterosaur researcher who has written a lot about this. And the way he's described it is that smaller pterosaurs taking off from the water may have needed to do a series of hops, mm -hmm. like a few of them. But, and the way he phrases it is, 
the biggest ones may have been able to Hulk smash their way <laughs> into the air off the water. <laughs> yes. So the quad Quetzal launch... Quetzal is the biggest there is. <laughs> 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 so this push-up takeoff model has become very popular among pterosaur researchers these days as an explanation for how you get a big animal off the ground and it could even be one of the reasons that birds don't get that big. Yeah. Birds are built like dinosaurs, and it means there are... A, we have never found a pterosaur roadrunner. Mm -hmm. Like, there are mm -hmm. certain things birds can do really, really well, but being the size of a small airplane uh, might not be one of them. Well, and, I, and I've seen things that have pointed that out, that it's weird that we haven't found flightless pterosaurs mm -hmm. because there are so many flightless birds. And indeed, there is no solid evidence for any secondarily flightless, right, pterosaurs that evolved from flying ancestors, like cassowaries and ostriches mm -hmm. and emus, which ancestrally flew. Yes. And have lost that ability. And it, it could very well be. It's like, well, yeah, because you've still got the the mechanics to be real good at running and jumping and hopping. Right. Regardless of what your front limbs are doing. Conflicting with each other. Exactly. The, the pterosaur, the entire body has been uh, reformatted toward flying. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that might limit how good you are at coming away from that way of life. I also love the quad launch because... That is such a much more alien way to picture them taking off. That's so cool. <laughs> than the typical bird of, I kind of look up, and I get my wings ready, and then I do a little hop, and then flap, 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 flap. Well, a, a jump with the legs is a very human thing. We, yeah. we can do that. We, doing. This would be like a, a pterosaur walking around and being all stilt-like and tall. Yep. And then all of a sudden, lowering its entire <laughs> body down, and then just... <laughs> well, and it makes me wonder, I was thinking about this the other day, I have a cat, and because mm -hmm. we live together, Will has a cat now too. I do. And I have felt her jump. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if you ever, like, cats, don't when they jump, they launch, right? They have these very powerful hind legs, and that's why they can jump up on a table in one go, where dogs dare not tread. Yes. And, a, you know, my cat, I've been laying on the floor... Or what, and felt her jump up onto the table, or mm -hmm. be at the table, and and she jumps off the table to go somewhere, and you can feel that powerful kick. Oh yeah, like that, if that shock wave that goes through the ground. If they ever jump off something that's not too steady, like I've watched them kick things over as they left it. Oh yeah, like <laughs> like the backdraft of a jet. And my cat is ten pounds. Yes. So I've been wondering, like, what would it have felt like? to stand near a 500 pound pterosaur as it to quote mark witten hulk smashed its way into the sky just would i fall over yeah right like what? that would have been so cool i feel like it would be such a yeah. violent because not only is it leaping and and launching that body into the air all then 30 plus foot wings Oh, yeah. Are unfurling yep. <laughs> and then pushing it into the sky. Like, that's that's too much. I don't want to be next to that. They're such impressive science fiction animals. <laughs> it's it, the more and more we ever learn about them makes me love the Dinotopia books more and more <laughs> where they have pterosaur writers and just yeah. like, man, those people would have to be the biggest of a adrenaline junkies now right. that we know how they function <laughs> now i should point out that if you ask a biologist and paleontologist most of them will tell you that it is unlikely that even the largest pterosaurs could fly with an extra 150 pounds added to them absolutely so you probably couldn't ride a pterosaur i think they're built to do a thing and the thing is not carry small dinosaurs in their feet as they fly yep but it's fun to dream yep Speaking of what they're carrying away, now that we know how they function on the land and in the air, let's move on to one of the biggest, most often discussed questions in pterosaur paleontology. What did they eat? Which seems like it should be an easy question to answer. Like, oh, is, they've got beaks, they eat beak stuff. Yeah. You know, just like birds do. But yeah, but once again, a lot of birds eat things in very different ways, using their feet and other features. And indeed, uh, this is uh, 
very commonly in paleontology, there are over a hundred species of pterosaurs. There is not one answer to this question. No. <laughs> they are very diverse. Most pterosaurs are ambiguous. We don't know what they were eating. They appear to have been generalized. They may have been eating anything they could find. Yeah. But there are a few cases where we have good evidence that points in certain directions. Probably the most famous interpretation of pterosaur diets is eating fish. Yes. And one of the reasons for this is that lots of pterosaurs are fossilized in aquatic environments. Sometimes they're fossilized alongside fish. <laughs> like, yes, you died in the shallow ocean in the western interior seaway, episode 71. And yeah, there were fish there and you fossilized alongside them. This is also why a lot of them are interpreted as like seabirds, seabirds albatrosses, mm -hmm. flying over the shorelines, things like that. But indeed, we do know that a bunch of pterosaurs ate fish. Yay! Because there are a handful of small pterosaurs. So Rampharynchus, very famously. Um, another one named Scaphognathus, for example. Where there are several known with fish in their guts. Yay! That they had gut contents of fish. Sometimes also aquatic invertebrates. That they were eating things out of the water. Cool. And indeed, those early pterosaurs, like Rampharynchus... Some have pointed out that its teeth are pointy like a gharial, mm -hmm. which take that as you will. Uh, some other time we'll get Will talking about <laughs> gharial teeth and fish. Yes. <laughs> this has also been found in pteranodon, gut contents that are fish. So evidence that at least some of the time, they might not have been specialists, but some of these animals were eating fish. And there have been studies on ornithochirid pterosaurs, which is another group of the pterodactyloids, that have looked at their bone isotopes, which suggest marine food. Cool. And coprolites. Always handy. Poop, episode 30, with fish bones. Now, this has also brought in the question of how are they getting the fish? Yeah, how do they catch the fish since we have uh, squashed the talons? And a lot of people like to get very fanciful and look at what birds do yes. and say, oh, could pterosaurs have done that? For example, skim feeding, yep. which is when you'll see a, a seabird will go down to the water, open its mouth, and just fly through the water. Like, with its mouth in the water, they'll fly th over it. There are skimmers, which are birds extremely specialized to this. Their lower bill is longer than the upper. Yep. Two better skimmers. They're scooping as they go. Yes. However, there have been studies on a bunch of pterosaurs that suggest that pterosaur jaws were not built to do that. That that might have been too... If a pterosaur tried to do it, it might have broken its jaw. Yeah. Too much... That's a lot of force you're putting as you're ru ramming it through the water at high yep. speed. So they might not have been skim feeders. Another popular suggestion, also... Uh, bird inspired. Bird inspired and depicted in Jurassic World. Oh, yeah. Is plunge diving. Yes. Dropping out of the sky and diving into the water like gannets do. Which is another thing that... Birds that do that today are very specialized to do it. Their skulls have a particular structure that basically means they don't shatter when they hit the yeah, water. Yeah, they don't just, you know, concuss themselves. And as far as we can see, pterosaurs did not have skulls like that. that that's a very extreme feeding strategy. You're turning your body into a yeah. torpedo. So, pterosaur, at least as far as we've seen so far, doesn't seem like they were skimming or diving into water. It's possible that they were able to grab fish while flying. Yeah. Like you'd fly and just doop, grab one. Or you're resting on the water and grabbing fish. Or you're hunting in the shallows. Mm -hmm. Like a heron. You're walking yeah. around grabbing fish. So we know they were eating fish. For now, it's probably best to stick to less theatrical interpretations of hunting. But who knows? We might discover more in the future. Uh, the the just picking as they fly once again makes me think of Fantasia. If you watch that one, the way they show them is they just glide over the surface of water, and then when they see something, they just kind of dip the head, grab it, and then keep mm -hmm. going. Which yeah. might be a very reasonable way to interpret them. Especially with those long bills, just like uh, chopsticks. Yeah. <laughs> On land, because not all pterosaurs are aquatic, there are plenty that lived in land ecosystems. A lot of pterosaurs that have teeth... Uh, the teeth and jaws seem like they were probably good for just grabbing small stuff. Yes. Insects, small vertebrates, which is a very generalized feeding style. You fit in my mouth, so I'm going to eat you. I mentioned early on in the episode Aneurognathus and its relatives, the short bulldog-faced pterosaurs. 
which are small in size. They have these short but strong wings, and some researchers have interpreted them as being very maneuverable. And so these have been interpreted as what are called hawkers. Nice. They're catching food on the wing. Yeah, they're actually pursuing it. So they're probably going after insects and grabbing them out of the air while flying. And indeed, some have pointed out that uh, Aneurygnathus seems to have bristles on its jaw that we also see in modern night jars, which oh. are birds that hunt insects on the wing. And those bristles might be helping them to hunt in some way. Neat. And Aneurygnathus is also, I've seen it noted that it's also found in deposits with a lot of insects, which I see what you're getting at, but also isn't that all deposits? Yeah, I mean, that, that's <laughs> all like, environments in a lot of it. But no, that, it's fair. They kind of outnumber us <laughs> most places. Uh, one other example uh, related to that is a, uh, a pterosaur from early Cretaceous China called Liaocipteryx, which has been noted for its hyoid apparatus, which is the throat bone. Uh, to which the tongue muscles attach. And some authors have pointed out that the hyoid is long and similar in structure. Will is leaning in to hear where I'm going with this to chameleons. No way! Now, that's not <laughs> to say that it was definitely doing the same thing as a chameleon, but a powerful tongue may have been used for tongue grabbing stuff. <laughs> That's fantastic. Which is just the idea of something flying through the air and passing an insect and going. Yep. Whoosh, yep. Oh, it's so cool. I, the, the idea of them also having like an ant eater type tongue. Like Ooh. then just going somewhere and then just going. <laughs> just <laughs> into a tree. Like, yeah. Landing on a tree and just. <laughs> 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 it's like when you get to see a, a woodpecker's tongue. Yes. Actually. That it wraps around their skull. Yeah, and they become uh, <laughs> Lovecraftian monsters. <laughs> well, speaking of Lovecraftian monsters <laughs> and land feeding, uh, there has been a lot of discussion about the giant edge darkens, mm -hmm. the real big ones. What were they doing? And there was a, a paper that came out not too long ago that involved Darren Nation, and Mark Witten, and maybe some others, that interpreted the giant edge darkens as what they called terrestrial stalkers. So walk, getting food on the ground. Yes. Walking around your ecosystem, grabbing things that you find along the way. So imagine like a heron, mm -hmm. which wades through the water, but instead it is the actual height of a giraffe. Like not, uh, it's tall and skinny like a giraffe. Actually. The height of a giraffe. The height of a giraffe. With a long face that is longer than you. <laughs> and I say that because unless you're like a professional basketball player, it's probably true. Yep. J s s creeping around on the ground, grabbing stuff. Yeah. Which is part of why they, uh, uh, the other study interpreted Hatsagopteryx as on an island where the dinosaurs were small. This could have been a dominant predator walking around on the ground, a giant predatory flying giraffe monster. Well, and I, it, I picture marabou storks. Yes. That's what I picture yes. whenever I, I think of this mode of hunting is these big, long build, you know, long, uh, would you call a pterosaur face a bill? Um, I've heard it called a beak. A beak. I don't know what makes a bill a bill. Yeah. Long, long face. face. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but why? Long face and then just going around and marabou storks typically, they do hunt. You know, they're not just mm -hmm. scavengers. Most things aren't. Uh, so they will take stuff, but they're usually not like taking something their size. Like when a hawk takes down a, a rabbit or something, that's actually a fairly large meal compared to the hawk. Right. And that's a very specialized thing. Yes. Most animals go for, most predators go for food significantly smaller than themselves. And that's what's happening with things like herons and storks is it doesn't matter if you hide because you're three inches long. Yes. And I'm four feet tall. I will find you and I will eat you. Yes. Like if you start to run, you're still in my reach. Right. After you've been running for a little bit. <laughs> so if you're like a little dinosaur or a little, or a large Mesozoic mammal. Yeah. <laughs> like, just, oh. It's, yeah. It, oh, these, th these things would have been 
terrifying. Yeah, you you just hope they don't look in your hiding spot. Yes, and I've then heard pluck you out. That they can't see you if you don't move. <laughs> there have there are some pterosaurs that have teeth that are particularly bulky, and some that uh, research has looked at the teeth and found wear patterns that suggest that they were eating hard foods. So some pterosaurs have been interpreted as what's called durophagus. Which is one of my favorite terms. Oh, it's a great term. I love it. Eating hard stuff. Eating shelled things. Eating durable stuff. Durable stuff. Uh, Caviramus, Dorignathus, uh, Cycnoramphus are all pterosaurs that have been one way or another interpreted as eating hard shelled foods. One, Sungaripterus, not only has these big, I, I've seen them described as anvil shaped teeth <laughs> in the back of the jaw, but the front of the beak was hooked, which some have suggested might have been for prying shellfish yeah. off of the, the ground and then crunching them in the back. Oh, that's real cool. So some pterosaurs were probably eating hard stuff. Tapehara, the one I mentioned, we mentioned before with the kite face, has toothless curved jaws that some researchers have pointed are similar to parrots. Ah. And so they may have been fruit or seed eaters if they were using their beaks in a similar way. But my absolute favorite, my absolute even more than the terrestrial stalkers, with apologies to Nation Witten, <laughs> there is a group of pterosaurs. There are a few, but most famously in a group called the Tenochasmids who have these long beaks, bills, faces, with lots and lots of very thin teeth. Very f- tightly spaced. A comb of teeth. In Tenochasma, the comb of teeth is spaced as closely as... Uh, the, the teeth themselves are spaced as closely as 0.1 millimeters. Wow. And the most famous, Pterodostro, which I believe we mentioned before, mm-hmm. had more than a thousand hair-like teeth in its mouth. That's just so many. These have been interpreted as filter feeders. Yeah, scooping and draining the yep. water. Put it in the water. You're like baleen on a whale. Yep. They will catch all those little teeth or that super thin teeth in pterodostro will filter out tiny organisms. The water goes through and then you eat what you caught. Mm-hmm. Both of those two types of pterosaurs I just mentioned also have large feet, long necks, long jaws, and have a lot of researchers have said they look like flamingos. Which is awesome. And indeed, Pterodostro's beak is even curved, kind of like a flamingo. Pterodostro is famously known from a site in Argentina with tons of Pterodostro fossils. This is why they're flying around the Argentinosaurus and Giganotosaurus in the Fernbank Museum. Yep. Which, and the fact that there are so many found in one place, some have said, well... They look like flamingos. They might have been (laughs) eating like flamingos. Maybe they were flocking like flamingos. And indeed, one of my favorite things, uh, and this, we definitely talked about this in the news. I don't remember what episode. It was a study from last year, 2019, that found coprolites, poo, that are probably from one of these Tenochasmids type pterosaurs. And the poo was mostly composed of microscopic organisms, marine <laughs> organisms, foraminifera. And mixed in with there were fragments of bivalves, crustaceans, and gastropods and stuff. Nice. And not only is that what you'd expect to see in a filter feeder's poop, but that's what flamingo poop looks like. So there, this is a group of pterosaurs with these comb beaks that were probably filter feeding. Which brings up the obvious question of what color they were. I guess. <laughs> we've, we've got to find one some. And I've seen pterosaur, pterodostro reconstructed as pink like a yes. flamingo. Now, I don't know that if that would preserve. Yeah. Because usually we're interpreting color from melanosomes, which are pigments exactly. in the skin. And I don't know if you would see that in a flamingo. I don't know that you would. So uh, for anybody who doesn't know, what we're talking about is the fact that flamingos are born white. Yes. And the pink color comes from the shrimp that they eat. Picking, it's like um, the episode of the Magic School Bus when Arnold ate too many carrots. Was, was it carrots seaweedies. or was it cheese? It was seaweedies. There you go. Yeah. And I, he turned I had it orange. on VHS. Because <laughs> yeah, that's a pigment. Mm-hmm. And you, you eat enough of it and you're going to change. So that's pretty awesome. So pterosaur diets are many and varied. And certainly we will discover more. <laughs> As were they. As were they. But one more thing to discuss before we wrap up our long and yet somehow not long enough discussion about pterosaurs. 
What about pterosaur reproduction? Where do baby pterosaurs Where do come baby? from? Where do baby? Well, yeah, no. What Was there a stork pterosaur? <laughs> Quetzalcoatl is So far, them. it seems like yes. <laughs> yep. Now, uh, I want to make brief mention of those head crests. So we mentioned that a lot of pterosaurs have these crazy head crests. Not much is known about what these head crests were doing. Mm -hmm. They have been interpreted as display features, which I think is a perfectly reasonable interpretation. And indeed, in some pterosaurs where there are enough preserved, and there are a few cases where there are in large groups of pterosaurs preserved, like Pterodostro. Uh, there's one called Hemipterus that has similar flocks of pterosaurs preserved. So in some cases, we can see that there appear to be sexual dimorphism in the head crests. Yeah, we actually have enough of the population to get some trends. So you can see we have a hundred pterosaurs preserved here. About half of them have a slightly different body shape than the others, and the head crests are smaller. Looks like males and females. Other studies that have been able to study pterosaur ontogeny, episode 33, their development over the course of their life, cool, have found that the head crests apparently show up late in their development. Which is something you commonly see if it's not a feature you need before your mating. Exactly. So they're probably displaying, maybe they're doing wacky dances and stuff like a lot of our modern animals do. I bet they were so noisy and it was so weird. Oh, they probably were. Ugh. But one of the big long-running questions about pterosaurs is what were their babies like? Mm -hmm. And for almost the entirety of the 200 or so years we have been studying pterosaurs, no one had ever found pterosaur eggs. Which is such a shame. The first ever pterosaur eggs were found in the early 2000s. I think 2004 or so is when they were first reported. Over the next few years, a handful more were found. They um, appear to often have been parchment-like. So soft-shelled eggs, like lizard eggs, like turtle eggs, yeah. as opposed to bird eggs, which are hard-shelled. In 2015, there was uh, the skeleton of a pterosaur named Quinpengopterus, which was preserved with two eggs inside of it, which is really interesting. Not just because, oh, there's eggs inside, but birds only have one functioning oviduct. Mm -hmm. This pterosaur appears to have had two. Cool. Which is which is the standard, right? Birds have specialized down to that. And then in 2017, a study was released from a site in China that was originally famous for the pterosaur Hamipterus, because here at this site there were 40 or so wow. skeletons of Hamipterus, showing dimorphism between the sexes, ontogeny from young to old. But in 2017, it was reported that that same site also had eggs. Not one or two eggs. Nope. Not two or three eggs. Nope. Two or three hundred eggs. This was such a cool discovery. Preserved at this site, and 16 of them had embryos fossilized inside. It's If there are jackpots when it comes to paleontology, <laughs> this is one of them. And this was cool to answer a couple of questions. One, what were all these eggs doing here? The fact that they were buried in four distinct layers of sediment suggests that, like we said with the Neanderthals, this probably wasn't one freak storm event or something. Mm -hmm. This was probably multiple flooding events over a shallow area of land that might have been a nesting site. Yeah, this sounds like a seasonal nesting ground. Yeah, that they may have been flocking in, being super noisy, and laying their eggs. And then this also ties into this question that, that forever people have been wondering about pterosaurs, what were their babies like? Yeah. Were they feeding their babies like birds? Mm -hmm. Were the babies just up and at it like, you know, a lot of lizards yeah. tend to be? When could they fly? Mm -hmm. Could they... Some have suggested that maybe they could fly straight out of the egg. Yeah. They just, like, you know, n newly molted insects. Yeah. No practice. Did Petrie fly out of the egg? Do we see Petrie hatch? <sighs> I'm trying to, I'm sure in one of the later movies they show it. Probably. I, We're talking about the land before time, everybody. Uh, Petrie himself definitely didn't because that's one of the things. Oh, that's right. That's right. In he the doesn't movie, yeah, fly. Okay. If he can't fly. That's right. That's right. These embryos discovered in this Chinese site, the authors noted, had no teeth, well-developed legs, and they were near hatching, these embryos. So already well-developed legs, but not quite as developed wings. Ah. Which suggests that when they hatched, they were ready to walk, 
but might not yet have been able to fly. There was also a study of uh, what appeared to be eggs of Darwinopterus that were interpreted as probably uh, that, mm, that were relatively small, are thought, like many pterosaurs, to have probably been buried the way that gators do it. Cool. Right? They were covered nests. And this is, a lot of dinosaurs are thought to have done this as well. Yeah. And the structure and shape and burial style of these eggs is has been noted that it is similar to a lot of reptiles. So maybe they were being buried and left behind. And then the little pterosaurs had to come up and fare, fend for themselves. There have also been some studies of ontogeny in pterosaurs, how they grew over the course of their life. Most notably in Rampharynchus, our little nightcrawler-tailed, non-pterodactyloid pterosaur, mm -hmm. and Pterodostro, our flamingo-mouthed pterodactyloid pterosaur. Studies have looked at their bone histology. Yes. That is the record of growth in the bone, and, and usually limb bones. Yeah, when you take those thin slices and then look through it. And what the research has pointed out is that they appear, and keeping in mind there are 100 pterosaur species, we're looking at a few, <laughs> but at least in these, studies have found that they appear to start out with a, re a very high growth rate, and then when they're about half adult size, they slow down. Interesting. Now, in the past, some have suggested that that shift might be that they reached reproductive age. Mm-hmm. That's okay, you know, you are reproducing now, and so you're slowing down your growth rate. But others have have suggested that if they're not yet reproductive at only half size, that shift in energy expenditure might mean that they're starting to fly. Yes, you have now gotten big enough in your aerodynamics of uh, attained the correct ratios, you're good to go. Yep. And now, up till now, you've been putting all your energy toward growth. But now you have to use a lot of that energy to move around, to get yourself food. Maybe you are, you've started to fly. If so, then that might suggest that they're born not flying. So there seem to be a few areas of evidence that say pterosaurs might not have been flying straight out of the egg. And if so, they are either on their own on the ground <laughs> and they're just living like lizards or there's some level of parental care. And so far, hard to say. We have not found a lot of evidence to suggest one way or the other. And like like you've insinuated a number of times, these were not a this was not a small group with only a few representatives, so you could have a variety. Right. Yeah. You know, there are lizards and snakes that do watch over their young after they hatch, and there are birds that don't. Exactly. So like there are many options as to how these babies might have started life, and it's very likely that a number of them were all happening. Yep. Which is cool. Uh, pterosaurs are so fascinating. They are so interesting. And I think that the big takeaway for me, as I learn more and more about them, like dinosaurs, it's easy to get this image in your head of a very homogenous group mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that did one thing and then went extinct because they weren't good enough. Yeah, the uh, they were yet another quote-unquote, evolutionary dead end. Right. And a lot of people, you know, in, in the early days of pterosaur research, they would say, well, pterosaurs went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous, and that's not long after birds showed up. Maybe birds outcompeted pterosaurs. Well, and that's, uh, they make a note like that in Walking with Dinosaurs, which as much as I love the series, time has progressed, things are outdated. They have a moment where it was talking about, you know, the the even the biggest of pterosaurs just couldn't compete with the more efficient, better built, right. highly superior birds. But birds were around for the last like eighty million years of pterosaur evolution, and now some have pointed out that pterosaurs may have gotten bigger mm -hmm. to avoid competition with the newer birds. That the maybe one of the reasons that they achieved such big sizes later in the Cretaceous was partly because birds were covering the smaller size range. Yeah, they may have just been really efficient at that small to medium range, and so the pterosaurs went to the extreme yeah. ranges. Or it's that birds could not get that big, mm -hmm. and so pterosaurs were able to take that on. But even still, they overlapped in size, they overlapped in habitat, they overlapped in diet. It Pterosaurs and birds coexisted for an extremely long time. It doesn't look like birds drove them to extinction. It looks like they fell to the same. Go to episode five. Yes. 
KPG Mass Extinction. Pterosaurs are one of the most regrettable losses oh man of the end cretaceous uh, they're just they're so cool they're fascinating and the fact that a game-changing study came out a week before the week before we recorded <laughs> this episode makes me very excited to maybe revisit pterosaurs three years from now and yeah. see what's new what have we learned we're we're just scratching the surface of what there is to understand about this weird, weird group. I also like pterosaurs because it reaffirms a point that we try to make as often as we can that just because something survived an extinction doesn't mean it was inherently better than the things that didn't. Right. That extinction just didn't kill it. Yes. You got <laughs> a, it's, it's luck as a much as anything else. Different kind of mass extinction might have been the, the antithesis to the birds. Right. And wiped them out. If it had if it had landed in China. Yes. If the asteroid had hit in China, who knows? Pterosaur, this episode has been a long time coming. We've spent a good deal of time on it here today. And we, of course, have left out a ton of stuff. Oh, there, yeah. We will put lots of links and a, a bunch of cool pictures <laughs> in the blog post. So go explore. Take a look at what we have in there. Learn. Go do on your deep dive and learn more about pterosaurs. One last thing. Before we wrap up the episode, one of the things that our patrons can do is ask us questions yeah. on Patreon. If, if you're above a certain level, you got a message from us with a link to a question form. And we have a question to answer. We've been restocked. Will, would you like to do the honors? Absolutely. Our patron Michael asks, can the process of fossilization be replicated artificially in a lab? Excellent question. That's a really good question. And yeah, partially. Yes, there have been some studies that have a number of studies that do what it would have called maturation experiments, mm -hmm. which subjects organic remains to extreme heat and extreme pressure because that simulates it accelerates a lot of the chemical reactions that we try to study during fossilization. Mm -hmm. And there was even at least one study recently that was looking at doing that in sediment. That you oh, put cool. something yeah. in sediment and then subject that whole thing to maturation experiment, to heat and pressure, and it allows the sediment to interact with the material in different ways. So it's not perfect, right? We're not creating fossils. And it, there are critics of it. Yep. Uh, like, it's, not, it's not a perfect method. Because mm -mm. a lot of the studies that have come out recently using it were looking at it for potential evidence of uh, soft tissue. Right. Can remains. soft tissue preserve... We're going to subject this to faux fossilization and see if it works. And see what the soft tissue turns into. Like proteins and, and pigments and stuff. To see what evidence we might be able to look for on real fossils. And there mm -hmm. have been people who come out and be like, eh, it's not a one-to-one. -one. Right. I'm not 100% not comfortable with the idea of using that as your example. So go ahead and look up fossil maturation experiments. And you'll see, that, yeah, there's been some cool studies into it. It's fascinating the first time i learned about it it sounded very sci-fi listeners dear baskin coil <laughs> thank you for listening thank you to our many requesters who yes. have uh, sent us this topic request we were so excited and happy to finally do it i'm glad we three years in we did pterosaurs <laughs> been a long time coming it was so much fun check out the blog post follow us on social media if you have requests for things, if you have questions, if you want to get in touch with us, find us on the Twitter, the Facebook, and all the places. Join us on Patreon if you would like. We release new episodes every fortnight, so mm -hmm. keep an eye out for the next one. Oh, it's February, isn't it? Yes. Darwin Day is coming up. It is. How about that? That's so timely. Oh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> and once again, best of luck. And all the strength to our friends in Australia, currently dealing with fires and ecological catastrophes down there. In On our social media and in the blog post, we will also post a link to the organization Wires that we're donating to. Yes. So you can look into it. We encourage you to learn, share, donate, vote if you can do those things. And if you know people from Australia, send them some love. Uh, like I said at the beginning, it's our home. Yep. We all live here, so let's let's work together on it. And we're all in this together. Listeners, thank you so much for listening. We will be back in a fortnight, 
and end of the episode. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye, Birdie. No, uh, no. That's not... uh, right now, I, I was trying to think. I always try to think. It's like, oh, is there some dumb punny joke mm-hmm. I can make? And now all that's happening is my head is going through the "I'll Fly Away" song from "Oh Brother, Where Art Thou," which isn't just from "Oh Brother, Where Art Thou." And now that I'm in the South, I know that a lot of those songs aren't like yeah. from the movie. They're songs that people know, but yeah. yeah so I'm, now I'm just going to be singing that. Most of the classical music I know is from Fantasia, which drives my mom insane. Yeah, <laughs> I'll be like, "Yes, this is that song from Fantasia." She's like, it's Beethoven. Well, it's time for us to R U N N O F T. Bye, everybody. Bye. You don't get that joke because you haven't seen the movie. I watched Barry Potter musical. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.